All right, well, at 7 p.m. Here's that we're all logged in on YouTube, so we can get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together tonight. We ask for the intercession of St. Margaret of Scotland and St. Gertrude, who we celebrate today. We call upon the Holy Spirit, who constantly guides our church into all truth, guiding the church through tumultuous times, and we ask for the constant intercession of all the angels and saints. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, Lord, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant to us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we, uh, don't forget, Joe, we got outlines over here. We, so today we're, we are doing, we've got four councils to get through, one of them being the most important, Lateran Four. Um, the, uh, then we have the two councils of Lyon and Vienne. So this covers um, a 100 a 100 year period from 1215 to 1312. Before I forget, next week we will still have class, right? I'm wondering if numbers might be a little bit lower since that that's Thanksgiving week, but it's uh, it's, it's going to be a fun one. The Council of Constance is a really important one. Um, so I hope to see you next week. And then the first week of December um, we will not have the first Tuesday of December, which is December the 7th. We will not have class. Uh, we will have our parish mission, which I hope, welcome everybody. Feel free to take an outline right here. Um, our parish mission, which will be um, led by Father Benedict LaVolpe, who is the rector, the head guy at uh, the National Shrine of Maximilian Kolbe at Marytown in Mundelein. Uh, Franciscan priest, so I hope you can come out for that. <coughs> All right, just brief review from what we talked about last week. 
the Holy Roman Empire, which is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Right? Um, it is a uh, it is a project of the medieval Western Church to as they as they begin to see the eastern part of the empire start to crumble. Uh, they take advantage of the situation. Not only that, you have centuries of popes in Rome who have been pressured by Roman aristocracy, and so. Um, but there's this rising. Um, union of kingdoms in Western Europe and so Pope Leo I can't remember which number he was but Pope Leo um, on Christmas in the year 800 crowns Charlemagne the Holy Roman Emperor and thus begins a long tumultuous journey of this kind of two-part authority in the Western Church Pope and Emperor um, I think of uh, if any of you are here fans of the show called The Office there's a season there where they have two co-managers, Michael and Jim. Co-managers doesn't work out super well. There's a lot of strife with that. Um, and that certainly is the case in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, there's, there's struggles for holiness within the empire. And it wasn't truly Roman because the emperors were not in Rome. They were in southern France and Germany. Um, and it's hard to really call it an empire because of its... Um, lack of really holding together. Um, nevertheless, it was very important for the building up of Western civilization, law and commerce and culture, and certainly in the area of faith. And it was also very important to what I said were kind of the, the good foundations of the Crusades, the original intent of um, trying to reach out to the Greeks, to the Eastern Orthodox, to bring about reunion, trying to run to their aid and protect them. But then, of course, over time, that kind of gets corrupted. Um, we'll have a little bit more about that today. Um, medieval councils, if we remember, they are different than early councils in their content, whereas the early councils are primarily about doctrine and secondarily about discipline. Medieval councils, those are reversed. Right? Most of the medieval councils weigh heavily on canons, on building the building up of canon law and kind of the structuring of society. Uh, they are papal councils. They are called by and led by and concluded by popes. Um, very often, all of the material for those councils were, was prepared before the council even met. That doesn't mean that there weren't vibrant deba debates at those councils. We often still had hundreds of bishops and especially the presence of um, monastic life. Lots of monks that would be present there. Um, and then uh, also there's the constant question of to what extent we can truly call them ecumenical rather than general, which is kind of the more modern popular way of referring to them. Pope St. Paul VI referred to some of these medieval councils as general rather than ecumenical because they lack the presence of Eastern bishops. That doesn't mean, however, that they don't hold weight for us. Um, right, we went through the first three Lateran councils, right? So now we're in the, those Lateran councils, that is another indication of it being papal because the Pope lived at the Lateran in Rome, um, and that's where he held those councils, and now we're gonna have a fourth one, Lateran V. There's all in all five Lateran councils, although we're gonna get through a number of them until the fifth one, the fifth Lateran council happens in 1515. So we'll get, at that, get to that at the end of next week. All right, um, so the 13th century, three of our councils today take place in the 13th century. Um, this is the height of medieval life in the Western church. Um, monasticism is, um, greatly responsible for the building up of Western civilization, especially after that fall of the Roman Empire. Um, this is this is before, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, the fall of that original classical Roman Empire in the fifth century, and um, and so monastic uh, monastic life was largely responsible for building up of communities, hospitals, and universities. <clears throat> and it's largely influential in these councils. Um, the third, 13, late 12th, early 13th century also saw the rise of what were called 
the mendicant orders. It means beggars. So like happens always throughout salvation history, you think of the Old Testament, God is good to his people Israel, they become prosperous, then they become idolatrous, and then they fall. Repeat and rinse and repeat over and over and over again. That happens in salvation history, that happens in the history of the church, that happens in religious orders. So, uh, and of course we've seen so far already that happens with the clergy too. About every 500 years, you have some major reform of the clergy. Um, so monastic life, because it was so central to Western medieval uh, life, um, was very prosperous. And often then that meant that they became lazy, lax in their observance of the rules of, for example, the most important rule, the rule of St. Benedict that guided monastic life. Um, but then you have two very important saints, St. Dominic, and St. Francis of Assisi that form the, the first two mendicant orders. Um, and so they, they, it's a re real return to a much more austere lifestyle. Whereas the Benedictines and Cistercians and other um, religious communities that are based off of the rule of St. Benedict, they make their money for the monastery by some kind of product, whether that's farming or beer or education. Uh, the mendicant orders don't make any money. They, it's solely by donation, and that's still the case today. And then the rise of the university. Um, so the 13th century is really a, um, never let people tell you that, medie that the medieval world was anti-intellectual. It was not. This is the rise of the university, in particular, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. Thomas Aquinas being in the Dominican school and Bonaventure was a Franciscan. Um, men of great uh, intellectual abilities, um, geniuses. And uh, the universities um, basically, I mean, they had a, a, a well-ordered, well-structured system about, you know, the various, um, subjects that you could do in order and the highest science when they when the medievals use the word science what they mean is the study of the cause of things so the highest science was theology because that's the study of the ultimate cause god but um you really couldn't get into theology unless you passed through many other levels of education you would have to go through um, law their own kind of medicine at that time um, business, philosophy, arts, and then finally theology. But the reason that the universities are important is because that's really where the theology of the day is being done. Whereas in the early church we find that bishops, the theology that they're doing is has an, an immediate pastoral um, impulse because it's, it's theology that they're doing for their diocese or for their congregation and then they kind of disagree with each other, they argue about different things, and then at the councils they really hash it out. Or theology in the middle in, in the medieval period in the West is being done in the universities. Alright, so the Fourth Lateran Council. This meets in the year 14, excuse me, 1215, and it was brought together by Pope Innocent III. And he said the reason why he called this council together, he writes, to eradicate vices and to plant virtues, to correct faults and to reform morals, to remove heresies and to strengthen faith, to settle discords and to establish peace, to get rid of oppression and to foster liberty, and to include princes and Christian people to come to the aid of the Holy Land. So here we are now, uh, over 150 years into the beginning of the, uh, under 150 years, they began in 1093, um, of the Crusades, um, and that those efforts are continuing at this time. Pope Innocent III, very important pope in the medieval era. Um, he was, I said that setting on long. Um, he was trained, um, educated at both the, the two biggest universities in Europe at the time, Paris and Bologna in Italy, studying theology and law. Um, upon his election, in 1161 to the papacy, he was quite reluctant. He was, I, I think, uh, very much like Pope Benedict XVI, if, if anybody remembers, 
like when Pope Benedict, after JP2 died, Pope Benedict, who had been working for 25 years or something like that as uh, the head of what's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the head theological office in the diocese, after JP2 passed, Benedict was like, sweet, I can go home and retire and read books. Um, and then he was elected to be the successor of JP2. Similar thing with, uh, with Innocent III. He desired to retire and to live a life of contemplation and study, but he was elected pope and reluctantly agreed to it. <coughs> For him, after a long series of popes being primarily concerned with daily temporal affairs, um, the structuring of society, um, uh, the enactment of laws, daily quabbles with secular rulers at the time, Pope Innocent III really wanted to return the papacy to the priority of spiritual and theological. So he always put the spiritual above everything. Doesn't mean that he didn't deal with many secular issues. Um, again, he was a, um, a master of law, but for him always, he, he desired to bring the spiritual over the temporal as a priority for his office and for the church. Um, and that's gonna be a reason behind his um, his constant resistance to what he would think of as secular overreach, this constant battle between pope and emperor, church and state, he's always gonna be pushing back on that, and part of that is the fourth letter in council. And he really changes the face of the priest, uh, excuse me, of the papacy as, you know, the way we think of the pope today, like, okay, Pope Francis says something and everybody's gotta talk about it, right? because we recognize that the Pope's important, what he has to say about matters of faith. And that's always been the case, but that changes in different ways, in different periods of time, of how much people care about what the Pope is saying on a daily basis, right? You have some of those early centuries of the church where it's like, remember the Pope's, many of the Pope's were at those major councils. Some of them, their theology were heavily influential. Um, some of them, they just sent a few um, diplomats to go to the council and make sure that nothing crazy happened so the Pope could put a stamp of approval. It's always been the see of Peter. It's always been the one to be the final say in theological questions. But Pope Innocent III, he's not the only, he's not the first or the only one, but really in the medieval period brings the papacy into the forefront of daily life for Catholics of concern over their spiritual lives. It's Pope Innocent III. Um, <clears throat> All right, so you'll see we have um, just four things I'm going to talk about from this council. First uh, concerns the first two chapters of what's called the Constitution of Lateran IV, um, and that is uh, a theological concept called Deus Semper Maior. I'll explain that here in a second. We'll talk about the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is defined at Lateran IV. Uh, and then they have some canons of clerical reform and issues of like law and social order. Um, uh, Lateran IV was kind of like often is referred to as the Trent or the Vatican II of the medieval church. It was really a big deal. Um, you had 400 bishops and, and several other hundred monks and abbots. Um, obviously the Pope himself presided. You had many major um, secular rulers, um, a, a variety of kings and princes. So first, let's talk about this doctrine of Deus Semper Maior. That means God is always greater. As I've been talking about, there's a huge intellectual development, growth and in, in, intellectual development during the medieval period. There is an obsession in the medieval church and society with truth, with desiring to conform to truth in society, but also in faith. We've talked a little bit about some of the heresies that the first three Lateran councils have had. Remember how the early heresies in the church kind of like specific in, um, complex questions about the natures of Christ, whereas in this medieval period in the West, it tends to be um, a little bit stranger, the heresies, like for example, the, the Catharists, if you remember last week, where the Catharists, there's like a wholesale rejection of the goodness of the body and creation and the sacraments. Remember, they, they didn't have any sacraments except for um, 
uh, a rite of consolation at death. And sometimes, so they would delay that until close to death and they would receive that rite and then would commit suicide. Um, you have those kind of early primordial Protestant-like voices like Peter of Breeze and Waldensianism that has a rejection of church authority. So um, it's a different type of heresy, but there's all these different heresies that continually pop up in the West in the medieval period. But now, at the level of the university, there's, uh, again, new complex questions about the nature of the Trinity. I'm not going to get into all of them because the councils themselves don't really get heavily into them, and that was, we could have a nice separate course on Trinitarian theology in the 13th century. The council itself doesn't specifically deal with that. The reason it pops up is, we'll see here um, in, a, in one of the later councils today, that there was a real desire in the West to try and make the intellectual case for the filio, filioque. Remember, that was a major sticking point between the East and the West. And uh, the, the West really wanted to try and defend the belief that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with that, the, le the high level of, um, let's say, graduate level theology in the universities, then you see little heresies in there. So trying to resolve this start to pop up. Um, and then, in particular, there's one heretic of the time who's pictured here. Joachim of Fiore. Joachim of Fiore, um, kind of look him up if you really want to get into him, an interesting figure um, during this time. But he had one kind of strange teaching. He taught about the ages of the Trinity. He said the Old Testament is the age of God the Father. The New Testament is the age of God the Son. And now in the church is the age of the Holy Spirit. Um, first of all, part of the problem with that is it sounds a little bit like modalism. If you remember um, when we talked about those very early primitive um, Trinitarian heresies, modalism was the belief that God is one God in three different forms. Like sometimes God is playing the part of the Father, sometimes he's playing part of the Son, sometimes he's playing the part of the Holy Spirit. So this sounds a little bit like that. Also, um, it's kind of a way of um, taking the concept of the Trinity and kind of forcing it into human history and trying to fully grasp God in terms of what has happened in different ages in human history. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, he kind of rose to fame the last few years, a Canadian psychologist, Jordan Peterson, and he has written a couple books that have been really popular. He's gone on speaking tours. The reason I bring him up is that um, it's been a constant question for Christians to what extent Jordan Peterson professes Christian faith because he's been giving, he gave a series of talks on the psychological significance of the, uh, the stories in the scripture, the Bible, um, and he every now and then seems to be on the verge of a kind of Christian faith, but yet he's not. And, what, and a few times when he's been asked, um, you know, really, what is your religion? He's kind of jokingly said, I'm the founder of the church of Joachim de Fiore. So he, he really likes this, this, uh, this 13th century heretic. But anyway, all of this is in the background um, for this doctrine at uh, Lateran IV on Deus Semper Maior. One more thing to add to this. Um, in the 12th century, there was a Benedictine monk named St. Anselm, and he's got a lot of great theological works, but one of the things he's known for is an argument for the existence of God. And it is probably in the world of philosophy and theology one of the most controversial arguments for the existence of God. Most people, when they hear it today, say it's hogwash, it doesn't make any sense, um, but you could fill libraries with the doctoral theses that have been written on this in the area of logic and philosophy. Um, but Anselm's proof basically goes like this. God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. Right? He's not the greatest being. God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. Then he says, it's obviously greater to exist 
than not to exist. Therefore, if he doesn't exist, he's not that than which nothing greater can be thought. Therefore, he must exist. Okay? People usually hear this and they're like, what? Um, St. Thomas Aquinas himself said that he completely he thought it was a bad argument and he disagreed with it. Um, I kind of like it, but, um, and I, but we won't get into all of them. The reason I bring that up is it, it had a big effect on theology in the 13th century, in particular, his concept of God. God is not, and, and this, this part, this much is true, and this is Catholic belief, and sometimes you can really trip people up on this. Is God a being? The answer is no. God is not a being. He's being itself. He's not this, that, or the other thing that you can point to. He's the very ground of existence. And using Anselm's definition, he's that than which nothing greater can be thought. He doesn't say the greatest thing you can think of. He says that than which nothing greater can be thought. It goes beyond all of your possibility of grasping, right? That is in the background here with the teaching on Deus Semper Maior. In the face of growth and intellectual development in the medieval period and the kind of medieval scholastic un uh, universities and their method of really logically trying to understand God and, and kind of um, explain them piece by piece for good reason, as well as this influential heresy of Joachim de Fiore um, about kind of like taking God and trying to put him in human history and then understand him in human concepts. Pope Innocent III defines this doctrine for the church. God is always greater than our human concepts about him. <clears throat> there are a variety of valid theological schools in the history of the church that come to God in different ways. But we have to agree on that. God can be known by what he's revealed to us. And there are things that he's revealed to us that we couldn't have discovered on our own. Nevertheless, he always transcends our ability to fully grasp him. Thomas Aquinas will say, you can't know God in his essence. You can know him and you can come to love him. But for all, you're not going to be in heaven and be like, well, I've been in heaven now for 13,000 years. I get God now. I figured him out. That's never going to happen. For all of eternity, you will be continually knowing God more and more because he's utterly transcendent, even though he's become imminent, meaning even though he has entered our world and become one of us. Um, oh, it's important to point out that this, is, this has an impact not just theologically, but culturally. Because for the medieval, for medieval um, church, God is more important than human concerns. God doesn't conform to us, we conform to him. God's the central concern of human affairs. And that's a very positive thing, because if God is the central concern, if God is God and he's the center of society, then no human being is and can claim that full authority. However, the negative side effect we do see is in, in a time in the medieval period where you might see in law and in theology a recognition of the dignity of the human person in practice, very often there are lots of threats against the dignity of the human person. There's a concern of truth over the human person. And of course, as Catholics, we want those things to be both in. All right, next, transubstan transubstantiation. <coughs> so, Early theology in the, in the early centuries of the church and in the church fathers, um, early theology about the Eucharist doesn't tend to isolate the Eucharist as a topic. It talks about it in the context of the sacraments. So you'll have various theologians commenting on what happens in the liturgy. Um, really famous one is the Catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, which is written to new converts during what's called, if, you, if, you're ever familiar, if you've ever been familiar or been a part of the RCIA process, the period of mystagogy, after you've been baptized, RCIA doesn't end. Now it's the, it's the period of really growing and deepening in that faith that now that you've received the sacraments, 
Um, and so a lot of the earliest Eucharistic theology is written from this pastoral perspective. And it's very clear um, in the early church fathers uh, that there's, it's, uh, there's nobody disagrees in the real presence. There's, it's very obvious from reading the church fathers, they truly believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and their commentaries on the Mass. However, we don't really get, um, with maybe a little exception with St. Augustine, but we don't really get a full systematic work on just the Eucharist itself, isolating it from the sacraments or isolating it from the Mass and just talking about what specifically is the Eucharist and how does it become the presence of Jesus. In the year eight, or in roughly in the 850s, there are two French monks who try to formulate their own systematic theology on the Eucharist itself. They got two fun names, Radbertus and Radtramus. They're both rad. Um, and uh, so Radbertus and Radtramus ask, how does the Eucharist save us? We know that the Eucharist is necessary, we know that it's necessary for salvation. How does it save us? Radbertus, looking at John chapter 6, where Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life within you. He says, clearly we need the physical body of Jesus for our physical bodies to be resurrected. Therefore, the Eucharist is the physical historical body of Jesus. And he gets kind of graphic with that saying like we, we like we tear limb from limb tendon from bone when we consume the eucharist right because he's trying to be very specific about the the literal physical presence of jesus in the eucharist red Tramnus says um and you may think that that's the catholic position but it's it's close but slightly off red Tramnus says well what is our salvation first and foremost but a spiritual salvation the physical resurrection is a is a an uh you know the spiritual salvation comes first the resurrection is a result of that and so what is required is the spiritual presence of christ received in faith so our soul is saved by a recognition of the spiritual presence of christ and and thus that's how the eucharist saves us okay so both are concerned with the effect of the Eucharist, and that's how they come to their conclusions about the reality of the Eucharist. Um, after them, you have what often develops two schools of thought that go to extremes. And in the midst of that, from let's say the, the 9th through the 13th century in Eucharistic theology, you kind of have two approaches that you'll find. One is an obsessive curiosity. Think of the caricature of the medieval mind when people make a joke about how monks would argue about how many angels fit on the on the what is it the end of a needle right the head of a needle right it's this obsession with like specifics about things that most people are like i don't know who cares right um but that is partly the medieval mind again in an obsession with truth with clarity with law with precision um but remember, Jesus doesn't say, take and understand, for this is my body. He says, take and eat it, right? So then the flip side of that is um, more kind of a willful ignorance. That's not a question we can answer, so let's not think about it. Well, we wouldn't want to do that with the mysteries of the faith, right? The Trinity is a mystery, so don't think about it, right? That tends to be, during this time, as the Orthodox, as the Eastern Church, sees the West wrestling with these questions, the East tends to go a little bit more in that direction of saying, like, it's a mystery, so you can't really answer those questions. So, for example, it's it's normal in Western theology to think about, at the Mass, when does the Eucharist truly become Jesus? In the East, they would say, nobody knows. Between the time the priest goes like this and calls on the Holy Spirit and the time that you receive communion, sometime within there, Jesus becomes present. Transubstantiation, the teaching uh, from Lateran IV, is uh, it balances these two extremes because it says something about the mystery which, without saying too much and leaving kind of the door open. So think back to this concept substance. We got this originally from the Council of Nicaea, right? The Council of Nicaea was the question, what is Jesus? 
Jesus is God. Substance is the whatness of Jesus. When you look at Jesus, what is it? Right? Council of Chalcedon and Ephesus were who is Jesus? And they say is what is Jesus? He is God. So what transubstantiation says is when you're looking at the Eucharist, what do you see? Jesus. That's what it is. And so it's a transformation of substance, right? Transubstantiation. Meaning it's no longer bread. So what they're saying is when you're looking at the Eucharist, it's no longer bread, rad tremis, meaning it's not just a spiritual presence of Jesus, right? But it doesn't say specifically in what way or how it becomes Jesus, other than by faith we know the authority of the Lord of Jesus it truly becomes him. But we know it's no longer bread. Now it is truly Jesus. <coughs> it is using reason why this pops up in the 13th century is because of the arrival of Aristotelian philosophy in the West. In the East, Aristotelian philosophy had really been used already. Um, he was Greek, and most Eastern theologians spoke Greek, so they had immediate access to him. In particular, by St. Maximilian, uh, not Maximilian Kolbe, St. Maximus the Confessor. Remember, he was the one who defended the two wills of Jesus at the Third Council of Constantinople. But it really doesn't arrive in Western theology until this time when you start to have translations of Aristotle in Latin. And in particular, now last week was super providential because, you know, we had the first class on the Lateran councils on the Feast of St. John Lateran. Well, we're a day off today because St. Albert the Great is the really the one we can thank for bringing Aristotle into the, into the West. And he was celebrated yesterday was the Feast of St. Albert the Great. Anyway, St. Albert the Great, the, the teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas, brings Aristotle and with him his concept of substance and accidents. I don't want to get too bogged down in Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy, but, but Platonic philosophy was the philosophy that was, again, think of philosophy as, as modern day science. It's the height of human intellectual, like it's the most respected in the academic fields, right? And theologians used philosophy to help talk about theological concepts. Plato believed that every physical thing you see and experience in the world is a shadow of a spiritual form, right? If you ever hear of the phrase, the platonic form, like the platonic form of a chicken sandwich is Popeyes, right? <laughs> right? If there's any Chick-fil-A people, I'll fight you on that one. Um, right? It means like the most pure form of what that is. So Play would say, when you see a tree, that's a, um, a shadow of the form, tree-ness, right? That's the substance, okay? The problem is, what's the reality to the real thing in front of you? Is there just some spiritual form of music stand that is out there in the ether? What is this real thing in front of me? So what Aristotle would say, who was a student of Plato, Aristotle would say, <clears throat> every physical thing that you see and experience in, in the world is a combination of substance and accidents. So there's the thing that it is, and there's the characteristics of it, right? So it's easier to use, like, for example, a person, right? The substance of who I am. I'm a human, Aristotle would say, a rational animal, right? That's my substance. Or we could get a little bit more into personalist philosophy, and there's the substance of me, who I am as a person. But look at pictures of me 10 years ago. The accidents are very different. I had a lot more hair then, right? So there's the substance, what it is, and then accidents, those external characteristics that change over time. Everything in the, the world of experience, Aristotle would say, the substance remains the same while the accidents change. An apple is an apple, and then it starts, it, it grows and it decays. There's change and evolution over the time of it, but it's always that one apple, right? A human being, in all the various stages, it's one human being. What transubstantiation does is turn that Aristotelian category over. It flips it over and says, in the Eucharist, the greatest miracle of all happens because 
the accidents remain the same and the substance changes. Now, um, some people believe that Aristotelian philosophy is outdated and it's just kind of been like cast away by science, by modern science. There are differences in, um, certainly in modern science compared to Aristotelian philosophy, but I would say there's some elements of Aristotelian philosophy that are perennial. They, are, they form some of the presuppositions of science today. R regardless, the Council of Lateran IV didn't say that this is the only way that you can describe the Eucharist. We have to understand the way in which transubstantiation was a, a reserved statement. They're saying that we know it's no longer bread, it is the real presence of Jesus, but it is not the accidents of Jesus, right? It's, now there are Eucharistic miracles that are signs to in, inspire our faith, where you have, for example, ones where they find that there's heart tissue in it, or it's, um, you know, uh, they weigh various different pieces of the Eucharist, and then they bring them all together, and it always weighs the same, right? Those are, are um, Eucharistic miracles, but it doesn't mean that every time you grab the Eucharist, that's going to happen, right? Those are things that, miraculous things that God does to inspire faith and to renew our belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, but those are all questions of accidents, right? So the accidents, right? Looks like bread, tastes like bread, feels like bread, smells like bread. All your experience tells you it's bread because all of the accidents of bread remain. If someone were to grab the Eucharist and put it under a microscope and say, I see bread, that wouldn't shake my faith because it is not the accidents that change. It's the very substance. And what Lateran and Four would say is, it's a sacramental presence of Jesus. It's really, really and truly the presence of Jesus, but it's okay to say it's different. It's real and it's physical, but it is different than the way in which he was historically present on earth, okay? It's still him, physically him, really him, a sacramental presence. That's why we believe when I break the host, I'm not splitting Jesus in half and breaking his bones. Every part of it is the real presence of Jesus. So, transubstantiation, the great, uh, now, you know, when people think transubstantiation, they usually think St. Thomas Aquinas. Well, this is, this doctrine is defined before him. St. Thomas Aquinas comes after this, and he's, it's, he's known for it because of how well he expounds upon it and writes about it. And that's, that's the beauty of some of these great doctrines in the history of the councils, is that they're at an end of the discussion and a beginning of the discussion. A new door is open. Okay, what does that really mean? How does that work? How does Jesus become present? <clears throat> Forgot to uh, keep these going on. I totally set the wrong timing on these bullet points. <laughs> that is annoying. All right. There are canons of reform, clerical reform. Um, a growing or a consistent problem with the education of clerics. So um, there's a rule set up where you need to have regular masters of theology at the cathedrals that can continue to um, train and, and teach um, seminarians. The system we have today of priests and training going together to a school, we'll see later as a result of the Council of, of Trent. Um, and at this time, priests were trained basically like everyone else was trained in the medieval world, apprenticeship. They would follow a priest around and learn and study that way. Um, as far as moral reform, there's a canon in Lateran II on priests getting drunk. They need to avoid uh, um, intemperance with alcohol, um, uh, obeying and abiding by their promise of celibacy and remaining uh, chaste. There's more canons on their attire, that if there's nothing fancy or expensive but simple clothing. Uh, there's canons telling priests that they can't take part in duels or violence. Um, and there's a canon, not that this is the first time it's happened, but there's a canon 
um, reminding them of the seal of confession. So you, you, you see that there's a problem in the early 13th century of priests breaking the seal of confession. Um, <clears throat> there's canons on um, rules for pastors. Uh, they can't leave the, pa the parish vacant. They can't bring profane objects in church. For example, they would bring like furniture in um, so that they could have a more comfy chair. I, I don't know, being up at mass with a lazy boy. <laughs> um, uh, there's a canon that says, if a priest asks to resign, you will be compelled to do so. You can't change your mind about that if you're gonna resign a parish. You can only have one parish. This is a problem that will increase more and more as we get to the Council of Trent where you have bishops, who, not just priests, but bishops who collect dioceses. They're bishops of several dioceses because they can make more money that way. Now, that's very different than the context of today where we have pastors who are pastors of multiple parishes because we don't have enough priests and because the size of these parishes is smaller, so one priest uh, can be overseeing several parishes. But in, the, in this medieval context, it was basically they're just um, taking advantage of a situation to make more money. Sons of pastors can't be in the same parish as their fathers. You still have some priests who had fathered children. Um, and then there's some canons of social order just regarding medieval life. There's a constant concern for justice. And interestingly, there's a canon in Lateran IV that speaks of, this is a huge buzzword today, social justice. It's important that we understand social justice in the Catholic context. Today, it's been adopted in a, in a cultural way, and so it's kind of like people get really nervous he, hearing the phrase social justice, but you find the concept in the catechism because what that means is there needs to be laws that are for the just ordering of society, right? And so there's canons on social justice, but when you hear that in the co Catholic context, that's different than the political debates today, but it's still a real Catholic thing, social justice. Um, lots of canons on against usury. Again, that's char uh, charging people or lending money at interest that the, the poor can't could never afford that interest. Um, there's rules on the regulation of religion in society. There's rules about how relics have to be in reliquaries in the medieval period. Relics are hugely popular and kind of in some places become a business. So they say relics have to be verified by Rome. Um, you have the multiplication of relics sometimes that the veracity wasn't, they weren't so sure about that. So for it to be a legit but relic, it has to be verified by Rome. Um, there's canons on punishment for unjust excommunication. Uh, there's a canon on um, a concern for when, uh, for the sick to seek what they say, spiritual well-being over physical well-being. But it's important to give the context. This is when you have some practices of medicine who use like magic arts. So they're saying, if you're going to find um, medicinal help, seek those that are in um, conformity with the faith. Don't go to um, your local wizard. Um, one kind of stain on the Fourth Lateran Council are um, three canons regarding Jewish people living within, um, within Western Christendom says that the Jews must wear a distinct dress, uh, that they cannot hold public office, and that converts from Judaism may not continue to, to practice any of their Jewish rites. They have to abandon all of their Jewish rites, which if you go back to St. Paul again, he says if you think that you have to practice uh, the, some of the laws of Moses, then you're lacking in your faith of the um, sufficiency of salvation in Christ. But he says, but you may practice um, Jewish rites still. Um, now, it's important to understand in this context, while it's these are canons, these are disciplines, these are not eternal truths, right? Remember, I had that distinction. There's doctrine and dogma that remain, you know, that, that are eternal truths that the church defines, and there's disciplines that come and go, right? And they're, they're, not, um, they're not having that weight of authority. It is, um, obviously, I, th I don't think it's any mystery today of um, the sins of Christians against Jewish people in medieval Europe. 
Um, one of the things to think about in this context with Latter and Ford, though, is the medieval West still sees itself as kind of the underdog and a persecuted underdog. It's trying to build up Western civilization, knowing that it's um, less glorious than ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, or even the Byzantine Roman Empire, the Eastern Christian Empire. And now with the rise of um, the various Islamic empires, the West sees itself as under attack, the underdog, and needing to protect itself. It even saw itself as, in a certain sense, um, inferior in a cultural, political way to Judaism because of how ancient Judaism ha had been, and as in, in particular, the, the kingdom under um, King David. So I'm not trying to wipe away the problem with these, but just, just to put that little bit of context there. All right. The First Council of Lyon, which meets in 1245. The background is, the, at this point now, another Pope Innocent, Innocent IV, and the Emperor, Frederick II, have a strong disagreement with each other, and they're both trying to claim their own authority over the other. Um, Pope Gregory IX, beforehand, a few years earlier, had tried to bring about the First Council of Lyon, uh, but was but Frederick II sent an army to stop that council from happening. Innocent IV is able to bring the council together. He begins with a homily uh, preaching to the council on what he calls the five wounds of the church. So this is a meditation on the five wounds of Christ as they apply to the church in this time. He says the five wounds of the church are the poor behavior of clergy and laity, um, the Saracens occupying the Holy Land, it's one of the parts of the um, Islamic, Islamic Empire, the schism between the East and the West, uh, the cruelty of the Tartars, These are this is Eastern Europe in Hungary where there's some battles going on over there, and then fifth, Fred, Frederick II's persecution of the church namely Frederick II as the um, Roman, Holy Roman Emperor trying to usurp authority, a spiritual authority from the Pope and bishops. Um, so the Council of Leon, again, this is in 1245, uh, he issues the deposition of Frederick II, right? So he's, um, what's the word for it in, in, for the American presidency? When you're... What is it called? I can't hear anybody. Impeachment. impeachment, yeah, yeah. He calls for the impeachment of the emperor, right? Um, but, however, it didn't really take effect. The people who, who were at the council agree. The issue is decreed, the decree is issued, um, but they don't really have the manpower to depose Frederick II. There are many, then there's many laws, or excuse me, canons to do with law, business, um, a few on the practice of excommunication. Interesting quote here on one of the canons. Since the aim of excommunication is healing and not death, correction and not destruction, as long as the one against whom it is pronounced does not treat it with contempt, let an ecclesiastical judge proceed with caution, so that in pronouncing it, he may be seen as one who acts with a correcting and healing hand. So you have um, an abuse of excommunications happening within the medieval church that the church recognizes and tries to fix. The Second Council of Lyon, in the year 1274, <coughs> um, St. Thomas Aquinas died on his way to that council. Gives you just an idea of where we're at in that period of history. Um, a little bit of background. Pope Gregory the Tenth was the pope for this. Um, there had been a three-year period before he was elected, so um, I can't remember who his predecessor was. But there was a, the, the see of Peter was vacant for three years because there was such disagreement among the cardinals and coming to a two-thirds majority of the vote. A little bit of a foreshadowing for next week because we're going to come across. Uh, the great western schism of three popes um, then there was also in the background the debacle of the venetian mercenary crusaders 
So again, I'm not going through all the details of the Crusades here, but there's one event where you have a group of Crusaders who are kind of stuck in Venice, and they're like they're no longer the good kind of Crusaders, where people like trying to rescue Eastern Christians, come, you know, putting their own life savings into this, desiring to make a spiritual pilgrimage. Now we have mercenary military men who are stuck in Venice without money. And so there's a, a secular ruler there who wants to kind of gain notoriety and, and, and gain um, kind of move up the ranks in, in the secular government. And so he hires them to go sack Constantinople. So whereas the Crusades began uh, as an attempt to help bring about union with the East, obviously this is still a big scar stain on East-West relationships where um, Western Crusaders went and took over Constantinople. Um, after, but it didn't last long that Constantinople was run by the West. Eventually, Byzantine, a Byzantine army takes it back um, with an emperor in Constantinople, Michael VIII, Heliologus. So anyway, the point is, is that I, I bring this up because Pope Gregory X brings together this Council of Leon number two in 1274 because he wants to try and reunify with Constantinople. They put together a document on the procession of the Holy Spirit, utilizing greatly the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, namely that whereas the Son is uh, begotten, right? So the relationship between Father and Son is that, when a Father and Son, the Son is begotten. It says the Spirit is not begotten by the Father, and is not begotten by the Son, but rather is spirated by them both. So if you think inspiration, it's like the mutual breathing back and forth of the two. Again, theology always has to use analogical language to describe things that are a mystery, but the language matters. And so um, this document says that the Holy Spirit is comes from one procession of the Father and the Son. So you see how it's a, it's trying to reach some kind of common ground with the East, because they would say there's one procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father. And you, Westerners, are saying there's two processions, from the Father and the Son. This document, using the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, is saying, no, it's one procession mutually from the Father and the Son that the Holy Spirit proceeds. There were, in fact, many Eastern theologians and bishops who agreed with this, there was an agreement, there was um, Michael the Eighth, the emperor in Constantinople, um, signs it. Um, however, Michael the Eighth isn't really a theologian. He's politically motivated. He wants to find ways of agreement with the West so that they'll continue to help them um, with the Crusades rather than sack their cities. Um, so it really doesn't go anywhere. There's some Eastern theologians that get on board with it, but the rest of the Orthodox don't really go with it. They're going to try again at the Council of Florence next week. Then we also see in the Council of Lyon, um, first time in a council where there's a, a definition of the doctrine of, of purgatory. Doesn't mean you never see it in theology before that. It's just the first time a council has made a statement on that. It says, if those who are truly repentant die in charity, before they have done sufficient penance for their sins of omission and commission, their souls are cleansed after death in, cleans uh, in what we might call purgatorial or cleansing. The suffrages of the faithful on earth can be of great help in relieving these punishments, as for instance the sacrifice of the mass, prayers, almsgiving, and other religious deeds which, in the manner of the church, the faithful are accustomed to offer for others of the faithful. There's going to be more on purgatory next week in the Council of Florence. Finally, this is the first time we see in a council a listing of the sacraments. Again, it doesn't mean that it's they invented the fact that there's seven sacraments. This is the first time that, like, there's a question about that and they're defining it and making sure that it's clear. Interesting, <coughs> this image here is one of the doors on St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and it's called the Door of the Sacraments. Wait a second, there's eight panels. Well, there was a movement within the church uh, in, during this time that believed that preaching was a sacrament. Now, I don't know about 
other pastors and other priests, I'll say my preaching is sacramental. No. Um, yeah, so there was a belief that perhaps preaching, because what is what's the main thing that Jesus do, does? He goes around and he proclaims the gospel. He sends the apostles to preach, to proclaim the gospel. So there was a thought that it should be listed as, as one of the eight sacraments. Um, but that's just not in the tradition of the church. That's a novelty. So anyway, we want to make sure to define the fact that there's only seven sacraments. Um, and they're canons. Um, there's more of the same, so I'm going to go on to the next <laughs> for time's sake. Uh, the Council of Vienne meets in 1311 to 1312. The background is the Avignon Papacy. Beginning in the year three, uh, 1309, the Pope lives in France, in Avignon. The, pa the Popes live in Avignon from 1309 to 1376. The reason for that is twofold. One, France is fun, and Popes want to live in a fun place. And Rome isn't in really the greatest condition at this time. It's, it's pretty worn down. St. Peter's Basilica, the first St. Basilica, St. Peter's Basilica, not the one that we know today, but the one that was built in the fourth century after the Edict of Milan, um, it's kind of in ruins. And uh, there's been fires and there's constant sacking by barbarian tribes. And so Avignon is like the place to be. It's, it's you know, upper west side of Manhattan. Um, however, also, there's political pressure for them to stay there um, and not go back to Rome. So there's, sometimes it's called the Avignon Captivity. So some of the popes are there because they want to be, some of the popes are there in spite of their, um, in spite of their best efforts. Um, so um, there's a, a document from this council written on this issue of how, you know, the popes have, are, are now kind of stuck here, and what are we going to do about that? It does, again, it doesn't get really resolved at this council because they don't come back until 1376. Um, the major, one of the major concerns of the Council of Vienna is on the Knights Templar. Um, these are uh, originally a religious order of pilgrims in the Crusades that now have become more and more um, primarily military. Um, and there's kind of a from my understanding, a little bit of a disagreement among scholars about the extent to which the, there were abuses within the Knights of Templar. King Philip IV asked the Pope to condemn the Knights of Temp, uh, the Knights Templar. However, he was in serious debt to them. So there's a sense that, well, he's kind of motivated here. Uh, and some scholars believe that Philip IV was able to get um, forced confessions out of Knights Templar to say that like in their signing in ceremonies they had to deny Christ and spit on the cross and that it's kind of an early um, growth of Freemasonry. Um, you know, the, there, I, I'm no historian on the Knights Templar, but the council denounces them and suppresses them. But what's important about that, regardless of whether or not it was entirely this politically motivated thing by Philip IV, what it reveals is that the church recognizes many of these problems that were happening with the, with the Crusades and is trying to stop them, right? The Pope is trying to clean those things up. Um, there's also interesting, um, an article in the Council of Vienna on the doctrine of the soul, utilizing the, the philosophy of uh, Aristotle, saying this is mainly against those various types of catharist heresies that denied the goodness of the body and just sought like spiritual perfection and tried to get away from the body. Um, the philosophy of Aristotle is that the soul is the form of the body. It's not like a ghost that's been like stuck inside of you and that's this separate thing from you, but rather just as the form of a triangle is three sides, three corners that add up to 180 degrees that can, that that's the form of it that then only comes into existence when it's drawn or built or created, right? So the same thing with the soul. It's not some separate thing that God like puts in you and pulls out, but it's the very form, the very concept. It's you that comes into existence. Um, with the body. Conclusion. So 
Many of these councils are about the building of a Western civilization. There's the ongoing problem of two-part authority. Church and state, pope and emperor. They're kind of separate, but they're intertwined. Um, what we will study next week is primarily the Council of Constance and the Council of Basil Florence. Sometimes seen as one, sometimes seen as two separate, but the most important one is Constance. That is going to be the council that um, resolves the great Western schism, not between East and West, but when we have three popes at the same time in the West, it resolves that, but it creates an interesting background that, that really doesn't get resolved for like 400 years. Um, and it's, it's very much in the background of Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II. Um, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming out, everybody.